the Joe Rogan experience. And so it began this investigation for me, trying to understand, because I was seeing the person who meant the most to me of anybody in life, you know, degenerating every day in front of my face, getting worse and worse and worse. It, it instilled this, this burning desire in me to understand all that I could and to share to, 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 in the hopes that it might prevent it from happening to others. And, um, and yeah, it was also very odd because my, um, my maternal grandmother did not have dementia. So it was really sad and, and surreal, in fact, that my mom was increasingly requiring around-the-clock care while her mother, who lived in the same home and was 30 years older, was cognitively totally healthy. It was just, a, it was just the oddest thing. My, my, my grandmother, my mom's mom, was in her 90s and totally cognitively healthy, able to have, form cogent sentences. And my mom was struggling to express an idea to get out of a bathroom. And it just, to me, it was, it was so shocking that I, you know, it was, it was traumatic. I mean, I still have PTSD, I think, from, from those days, but it, it's, yeah, it's motivated me to, to do what I can to help. And I saw all in, in every, you know, by the end of my mom's life, she was on 14 different pharmaceuticals. And I'm not, I'm not anti-pharma. Like if, if there was a drug that would have actually helped my mom, I would have been first in line at the pharmacy to, to fill that prescription for her. But the drugs don't work at all. And physicians are very quick to, you know, to write a prescription. to like add a new drug to the arsenal. They're, they're very um, reluctant to deprescribe. I've, I ha- have never seen a prescription deprescribe to my mom. And by the end of her life, she was on 14 different pharmaceuticals. And there's nobody on earth that, that understands how all of those different drugs are interacting in, an, you know, in, a, in a system that's going, growing increasingly frail. It was just really sad. And, you know, so I started to investigate these modifiable risk factors, you know, whether it's diet, dietary, diet related, which it, you know, in my mom's case, it may have had something to do with her diet over the years. It might have had nothing to do with her diet over the years. I'll never know. But also now we're starting to see that air pollution is a major um, contributor to neurodegeneration. We're starting to see now that, well, as of 2020, it was acknowledged that um, exposure to air pollution is actually one of these newly identified mod- modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. So exposure to fine particulate matter, PM 2.5, actually might cause Alzheimer's disease for some patients. And then most interestingly, and this is one of the things that I want to talk about with you, which I came across the work of a, of a neurologist named Dr. Ray Dorsey, who's over at um, University of Rochester, who's done a lot of work publishing on the link between environmental toxicants and Parkinson's disease. But Parkinson's disease is now the fastest growing brain disease. And my mom's condition actually had more in common with Parkinson's disease than it did Alzheimer's disease. She had Lewy body dementia, which is, has more in common with Parkinson's, even though they're, they're both dementia, um, Lewy body and, 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 and Alzheimer's. But there's data now linking exposure to certain herbicides and pesticides to Parkinson's disease, dramatically increased risk, anywhere between three, two and a half to six fold um, increased risk. Which herbicides and pesticides? So there's a pesticide called Paraquat that there's a great article written in The Guardian by um, a journalist named Carrie Gillum. And I got to speak uh, on a panel with her recently at a, at a scientific conference in DC called Brain and Environment. And Paraquat is this compound that it's, a, it's an herbicide that's produced in China, but its use is banned in China. We import it here. Yeah. It's crazy. We use it here and exposure, occupational exposure to this compound is associated with between two and a half to three times a risk for the development of Parkinson's disease. Related compounds are literally used in mouse models to create Parkinson's disease. And the company that has, that creates it, is has been under investigation for years and what has now come to light is that they knew about the fact that these that that these chemicals accumulate in the brain in brain tissue and they seem to selectively target the region of the brain associated with parkinson's disease the substantia nigra wow it's very scary and um you know, what what um, crops are these used on? Is it specific crops? Is it specific foods to avoid? Or 
how do you know if those pesticides or herbicides are being used? Well, it's it's the the residues and the the exposures that you get from eating them is very low, but we don't know what long-term exposure to those low levels is doing to us. I mean, my, my, my mother is somebody who never believed in organic produce, right? And organic is not perfect. And natural compounds, some of them are the most dangerous compounds on earth. So I know, you know, some people listening might say, oh, you know, here we go with the appeal to nature fallacy. But it's very clear that occupational exposure is very hazardous. You have to be licensed. You have to use this stuff very carefully. But it, some people actually use it to 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 off themselves. I mean it's like a, it's a really toxic compound and we're now we we now have data suggesting that it creates this condition that it selectively targets and, and destroys dopamine producing neurons that 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 mediate movement. And um and it's used yeah, it's used in in cereal grains things like that. Other than the environmental factors, what dietary factors contribute in, except obviously pesticides and herbicides that are unfortunately a part of our food system now. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing, like or, organic is, uh, as I mentioned, it's not a panacea. And there, today on social media, if you even, if you in so much as mention organic and that debate organic versus conventional, I mean, there's, there's so much controversy, but you know, I think the, as we've seen, right, with Paraquat and this Chinese company that has shrouded the data, and in fact, they they've assembled internally a SWAT team to basically to essentially suppress data suggesting harm due to exposure to this to this herbicide. Even though it's banned, in even that though even though it's banned in China, yeah. Wow, just so they could keep selling it. Just so they could keep selling it. But there was a, there was another there was another article that came out recently in um, the publication ProPublica, written by I believe her, her name was Sharon Lerner, another journalist who I connected with at this. DC event that I was at recently, who it was this crazy 3M has been hiding the health harms, shrouding the health, suppressing the health harms due to exposure to these PFAS, PFAS compounds that are forever, forever chemicals, known endocrine disruptors. In so, band-aids. Yeah. So there's, there's like all this corporate collusion and shrouding of the truth. And I'm just like, I think insofar as you can reduce your exposures to these kinds of things and 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 selectively, you know, if if money is 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 scarce, you know, selectively buy certain things organic, I think that makes sense, you know. Do they have organic band-aids? That's a good question. I don't know. But they yeah. recently identified these compounds and yeah. Yeah, I read the study about <laughs> the band-aid thing and I was like, Jesus Christ, is anything safe? It's not <laughs> fucking band-aids. We've all got microplastics in our balls these yeah. days, microplastics yeah. in our atheromas, right? Yeah. Like they found in our in our arteries that the presence of microplastics was associated with two to three two to three fold increased risk of cardiovascular death. So here it is, uh, partnering with environmental health news, a consumer watchdog sent 40 bandages of different brands, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency certified lab. The lab found that 65% of the bandages contain, contain detectable levels of synthetic forever chemicals, or PFAS. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and the-, the that, that is so crazy, because that's an open wound. <laughs> yes. It's like literally mainlining right into your bloodstream. It's nuts. And you talk about this stuff today on social media, and you're accused of fear-mongering, of being alarmist, you're not it's yeah what is that though is that trolls from pharmaceutical companies <laughs> i mean they're there that's something that i guarantee you corporations use mm. if if nations use it and we know they do and we know we do we know that there's troll farms in russia we know this is a real thing why wouldn't corporations use that too especially if they could farm that off and be removed from it as far as like being able to trace back the paperwork i mean we see it all the, i mean even within our own you know within our own government the usda the the dietary guidelines for americans 95 percent of people on that committee have had have or have had conflicts of interest with the pharmaceutical industry and the food industry yeah at least 50 percent that i'm aware of today you know working on the 2020 2020 2025 issue um we see all the time. There's been a number of uh, great um, journalism done by done in the Washington Post, um, exposing how the food industry pays dietitians to promote, you know, certain 
a certain ideology around food that mm -hmm. all foods are cool. You know, you just have to eat less and move more. All foods fit. There are no good or bad foods, which... Yeah, it's I, hilarious. It's hilarious. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, these companies, they, they pay these people that are body positive influencers as well. You know, so they're, they're basically paying people that are ill because of eating these things to tell other people it's okay to eat these things and that it's somehow or another phobic, whether mm. it's fat phobic or whatever it is, to not encourage body positivity. And it's stupid. It's just stupid. It's stupid for the people that are getting it. It's, stu it's stupid for the people that are promoting it. It's stupid for our culture to be inundated with this nonsense and misinformation where we have to sort through it and try to do deeper research and consult, you know, consult people who actually understand what's going on. It's so disheartening that we live in this world that's so compromised by money that information about key things like your own health is so distorted that it's hard like you know you talk to people and so many people have like a basic misunderstanding of what is good and not good for you and it, all of it is because of this kind of thing that it's just so prevalent and it's so confusing and you're getting expert advice from people which is one of the wildest ones for me when you look at oh thank you some coffee in your system there, fella. Thanks, brother. Cheers, sir. Cheers. Good to see you. Same. Um, one of the things that's crazy to me is that we get expert advice from people that are clearly sick. How many times have you had nutrition or dietary advice from someone who is obese? Yeah. You're fat. You're, you have no muscle. Your body looks like it's just in decay, and you're the person giving advice. Yeah. I mean, mo most of the social media, you know, personas that I've observed that purport to be experts or that, you know, that that seem to have, I don't know whether it's through cred credentialism, a, a degree of authority. I mean, I wouldn't send a loved one to, yeah. you know, I, it's just gaslighting on a, on a mass scale because, you know, your your average person today comes across this ideology that all foods are fine. It's all good. And they try to reduce their consumption of the crap that they're already eating. And they end up failing at that because it's really hard to moderate your consumption of these foods, which have been engineered to be consumed quickly and regularly. And then they feel as though they're, you know, they feel, they feel moral failure. And, and then it just creates this vicious cycle of, of yo-yo dieting. We're not being honest about the way that these foods impact behavior. And today, 60% of the calories that your average person consumes comes from ultra-processed foods, which are foods that are highly calorie-dense, they are nutrient-poor, they are minimally satiating, they're uber-delicious. I mean, they push your brain to a bliss point beyond which self-control is, is seemingly impossible. And by the way, it's these ultra-processed foods that are a major route of ingestion for these kinds of chemicals that we're talking about, these industrial chemicals, forever chemicals. You know, ultra-processed foods are... You know, if you want more phthalates in your body, consume more ultra-processed foods. There was a study that recently was published that found that for every 10% increment in ultra-processed food consumption, pregnant women were ingesting about 14% higher levels of, of these phthalates, right? I mean, you had, you did such an amazing episode with Shauna Swan a couple years ago, talking about the fact that our exposure to these chemicals are reducing the anogenital distance in boys, right? Which is a, which is a, a very easy, well, I don't know about if easy is the right term, but it's a very... It's, it's a very simple uh, proxy to use to identify how these compounds might be affecting us, right? But that's only what you can observe. Like, how are these chemicals affecting us in other ways? Right. You know? And, um, and so it's crazy. And, and these, are the kinds of, these are the kinds of foods that we're just eating en masse, day in and day out. And 60% is the average. Children consume about 70% ultra-processed foods today. On average, black Americans, unfortunately, consume... 80% ultra processed foods. And there's obviously, it's, this is not all choice. There are systemic issues. Many people today still live in food deserts. Accessibility is an issue. Cost is an issue. I know all that. But the messaging that we're getting from our most trusted sources is essentially that everything's fine. Just eat less, move more. 